is Ken Kreitzer for Sons of the American Legion Radio, our weekly Army football huddle. Uh, this week, it's UMass Week. Army won its sixth game of the year on Saturday in convincing style, 63-10 to 10 over Bucknell, and uh, is now uh, with six wins, is bowl eligible. Um, game was... Uh, disrupted by a rainstorm and lightning storm that came in just after halftime. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the crowd had to leave. And uh, uh, second half uh, was a uh, game where a lot of the uh, younger Army players who don't, and players who don't get a chance to play a lot got a chance to uh, be out on the field at Mikey Stadium. Now, we have our huddle assembled uh, with us tonight. And uh, from, the, uh, from South Jersey, we have West Point alumnus, former Army football player from the class of 92, Steve Shalou. Steve, how are you? Living the dream. Absolutely. And from uh, the, Beat, uh, the Beat Navy studio in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, we have Colonel Sam Houston from the class of 87. How are you, Colonel? Great, Ken. Getting ready for UMass with a Samuel Adams winter lager. And... Uh, <laughs> Celebrating already, being bowl eligible for the uh, what is this fifth time in six years? So go on. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a remarkable change of uh, opportunities for Army football under Jeff Munkin. And next is uh, from Pelham, my SL Radio WVOX colleague Jack McGurk. Jack, how are you? Doing very well, Ken. How you doing? Good, good, and. Uh, uh, calling in from Florida, another SAL radio uh, staffer, and that is Richard Miller. How are you, Richard? Very well, Ken. Great, great win for Army. They're bowl eligible. Hopefully, they can keep it rolling. Yeah, yeah. We have a have a, they have a few more games left, and uh, we're very pleased to have with us a special guest uh, uh, tonight, a uh, a former NFL player, and. Uh, uh, more importantly now, a, a West Point dad, uh, and that is Patrick Morrison, who is the father of uh, Army senior, uh, Malcolm Morrison. Mm -hmm. Patrick, how are you today? I'm good, Ken. Thanks for having me. Glad to be amongst some uh, some uh, veterans here, uh, to be in the midst here. So uh, I, I expect to have a wonderful conversation tonight. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Now... Now, we, we, we thought of you, especially uh, with Senior Day, <clears throat> will be against UMass on uh, Saturday. And uh, uh, the parents will be down there on the field uh, as each of the players and uh, managers and mentors, as Coach Munkin said uh, today. I think it's 27 players on this year's team will be recognized. What is that going to be like for you uh, uh, and uh, – and your son uh, on the field uh, for senior day. It's been such a, load, a long road from uh, for uh, Malcolm from Iona Prep to West Point. To be quite honest, right? I always say I'm a tough guy, but I think that day I'm going to be emotional. I'm going to be a proud. I'm going to be a proud dad that day. Um, I don't know. God willing, I'm able to hold back some of the tears, but. It's going to be a it's going to be a, a proud moment for our, our entire family, as you said, from Iona Prep, um, from from those days when uh, his counselors and whoever said you'll never play FBS football, and now he's playing in one of the best programs in the country, and one of the best academic institutions in the country. Uh, we can't be more proud of Malcolm. Absolutely, absolutely, Patrick. Just give us a, a quick thirty second on your background. You've you you played in the NFL. Uh, um, and uh, you're an author, also uh, a native uh, of London, if I remember our last conversation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So really quick, um, Pat Morrison, um, uh, I was born in London, England, and I wrote a book. Well, let me go back. You know, when you, when you, when you play professional football and, and, and you go into a community, oh, you coach football, or you play pro, pro football, you play pro football, can you come and speak to my children about football, about school? So it all started that way, um, just going around talking to uh, youth um, at football camps and in high schools and middle schools. And, and from there, someone heard my story and said, why don't you put it in a book form? 
So um, I thought about it uh, back in 2002, maybe 2005. And um, I started writing it then. And it talks about my journey from London, England, where I was born. Um, my mother came here um, and I stayed in London for three years. So the book is not only about just football, it's about some of the um, things that I had to deal with. Um, and I talk about it in my book, Before Common Ground, Living American Dream. Um, I suffered some abuse um, and um, some neglect and some really, um, some tough times while I was away from my mother. But the book all talks about, you know, as a tall, dark skinned, funny sounding Englishman moving to New York. So, you know, I was getting bullied a little bit. So I had to deal with that. Um, um, but but I, what it talks about is me taking that anger from being abused, taking those frustrate, frustrating moments and redepositing it on the football field. Yeah. Redirecting um, the pain and all that on the football field. So though I was skinny, tall, skinny, um, it really didn't matter, right? So if he was in my way, he's going to feel some of that pain that I was feeling. So I talk about that in my book. And, and I think that drive and that motivation is, um, is it was the foundation of me being able to um, play college football, obviously, and uh, have an opportunity to play in the National Football League for the New York Giants. That's great uh, that you were able to uh, overcome a lot of adversity to uh, get, wh which college did you go to? Where did you play at? So I played, I played, I got recruited at some division one schools. Um, um, academically, I wasn't, I didn't, I probably knew if I, if I went there, I probably wasn't going to last long. So I went to division two school. I had a little ego working too. I wanted to play four years and not wait two, three years, uh -huh. register the whole nine yards. So I went to Southern Connecticut State University in New Haven, Connecticut. And my college coach at the time was Kevin Gilbride. If mm. anyone knows Kevin Gilbride, um, yep. he was my mm. college coach. He recruited me. Um, and uh, he made me into student athlete that I end up turning into. Very good. And uh, what years did you play for the Giants? Is there a quick highlight uh, from those years? Yeah, so um, I was, uh, I was a, in a supplementary draft. I was ranked number 21 in the country as a defensive back. Um, it was the year Rod Woodson came out that played for the Steelers. He was the number one. I was number 21. <laughs> And, uh, and that was 1987, um, and I was able to sign a, a contract with, uh, with the New York Giants. Okay, very good. We're glad to have you with us, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, the game last week, this week, and Army's uh, fortunes uh, for the rest of the season. And why don't we go around the table and uh, talk a little bit about the 63-10 uh, to 10 win over Bucknell on um, it was 14 to nothing before um, everybody sat down, I guess. Uh, let's see, who would like to start? Jack, you were uh, watching the game pretty closely. Yeah, it was a pretty good game. We all were predicting that it was going to be a blowout uh, win for Army. I don't know if we were uh, expecting there to be a 42 nothing score at halftime. Uh, but uh, great game for Army, 486 yards rushing. Um, they got everybody, you know, trying to play as many people as possible in the game. They actually had eight rushing touchdowns with eight different players, which is pretty impressive, um, along with uh, that touchdown pass uh, by Jabari Laws um, right before the end of the half, first half. Um, and, of course, it was interrupted by that uh, thunderstorm, which uh, sounds like there was a big downpour on the field there. Um, and uh, But ultimately, you know, nice uh, win, 63 to 10. A lot of push-ups uh, for the cadets there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sam, uh, you were at the game. Uh, it was great to see you beforehand. And uh, and uh, what was your impression? Certainly, you know, Army's playing very consistently this year. And uh, when they had a an opponent an opponent that they overmatched, they 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 uh, didn't you know really let up and just uh, kept playing the way that they can. What was your impression? Well, first, the light bulb came on when Jack was talking just now. I now understand why the Corps cadets did not come back to the stadium. They got tired of doing push-ups, and they were like, <laughs> we're not coming back up there. We're going to have to get in that end zone and do a bunch more push-ups, and they would have, too, because 
the game itself was exactly, it unfolded exactly the way everyone on this forum predicted last week. We all said that uh, the bench is going to empty out. The, sc the score is going to get out, out of hand real fast. Bucknell is not a very good team. And uh, a lot of the players on Army's uh, squad who uh, don't normally get an opportunity to shine on the field got their opportunity to get out there and, and uh, put forth their best effort. It was great to see uh, uh, a first, uh, a first he get his first ever touchdown out there. And, uh, you know, these types of games afford um, the coaches the opportunity to be able to give – uh, depth opportunities to have uh, reps on the field. And, and really watching from start to finish, aside from the weather, and uh, which, which is a whole nother story, uh, it was pretty spectacular actually. <clears throat> the game, uh, I saw very little negative in the game at all. Um, in the first half, Army had to punt one time and it wasn't because of a Bucknell stop. It was because of a stupid unsportsmanlike penalty that uh, put the offense way behind schedule. And uh, even though they had like about a fourth and three um, after they played their sequence of downs uh, after the penalty, uh, they elected to punt. And I think that was the only time they punted the whole game. And then in the second half, uh, I honestly cannot count that uh, targeting penalty as uh, something against Army because I, from my vantage point and from the replay, I personally did not think that that was targeting. And um, that penalty directly led to Bucknell being able to get onto the scoreboard because I think on the very next play is when Bucknell scored and had that penalty not been called, they were looking at a third and long, long distance, which probably would have resulted in, in no points. And then uh, there was the glaring mistake on the subsequent kickoff where the uh, kick returner uh, went to field the ball, muffed it, picked it back up, ran laterally, got hit, fumbled, and Bucknell recovered on the Army 10, which led to another Bucknell, uh, led to a Bucknell field goal. Um, and you know, if that field goal had not happened, and I was thinking about this today, uh, I think the spread on the game was 50, 53 and a half points, I believe, maybe 54 points. If that field goal had not happened, uh, Army actually would have, would have beat the, they would have made the spread on that game. Um, so I think the odds makers had something to do with that field goal because uh, they didn't want Army to make a spread that it being that big. But, <laughs> no, no. no it, it was a great game, and, and I was so happy. I know everyone was very happy to see all of that depth play, and they played very well. I realized the competition, uh, it, depending on the, the quality of the competition, it can, make, uh, the, it can make whoever's on the field shine pretty good. But uh, believe me, Army took advantage of every opportunity for the depth to shine, and they did. And, and uh, aside from the weather, it was a great day. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, Steve Shalou, what was your impression of the game? Uh, and uh, it certainly was uh, difficult uh, for the fans because everybody had to leave the stadium. And I know you had to head out to uh, check on, on your tailgate. Uh, uh, what? Uh, so tell us first, what was your impression of the game? I mean, I think a couple of things that needed to be accomplished coming out of, uh, out of the week. One, we had to get – you know, let's work on fundamentals. Let's get some of the starters some rest. We're, we're kind of banged up. We're dinged up across the board uh, between uh, the Bucknell game and the UMass game. I suspect we'll be able to rest some people a little bit and and get ready for a, a pretty tough stretch run with, with Liberty, um, who's playing really good football, and then Navy, who's go who's rising, and as we've talked about, and, and they're going to be always ready for us at the end of the year. So it's time to get us uh, uh, a little bit healthy, try some fundamental, try some different plays. The, the biggest takeaway, I, I just can't tell you how impressed I am with Carter and the way that he's playing, made another big play. Um, you know, he's continuing to add to his resume. Uh, and he's a 
he's a, a force to be reckoned with. He's he's got all the intangibles. He's he's uh, he's got length. He's got speed. Um, I just I just love watching him play and, and complimenting the rest of the defense. So I I, I I that was one of the takeaways coming out of that. And you know, other than that, it was it was a it was a spring scrimmage for the most part. Yeah, that's what it reminded me in the second half was an August scrimmage where you're you know going to your uh, lineup card to check who's making plays, but um, but that's where you sometimes new you know new players stand out and earn earn opportunities is by big performances and hustling uh, in those situations. Uh, uh, the, the, Richard, the, the, uh, the only disappointing thing that can come out of it, really, Ken, is that there were probably a lot of parents that were counting on watching their kids play for the first time. And they didn't get a chance to see it because when they came in, it was in the second half and, it, and the storm pulled them out of there. That's the only thing. I mean, I remember the first time I got in the game, we we're 49 nothing against Lafayette and and uh, I got in that game. So, uh, and I'll always remember that. And it's just a shame that their mom and dad weren't there to to see it and then pat them on the head. And and and, and to, to make matters worse, grandma who was sitting at home, they, they, they cut away from the uh, CBS coverage and went to a different game, so they couldn't even oh. watch it at home. So they didn't show the oh. second half on CBS? No. They, they, yeah, oh, they I, cut away. They went to a different oh. game. Yeah, I didn't realize uh, that they did that. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I figured they came, They went to the studio and then came back. But, yeah, they would have had another game schedule to start at 3.30 um, on CBS, and uh, they don't like to give up their uh, studio show. I mean, I suspect it was within seven points. They probably would have came back, but you know, they were. They, it was. It was a pretty big spread at that point. That's it. That's interesting. I didn't realize that CBS didn't come back. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is too bad. We could have. You know, I tell them all the time. We can set up and do it. <laughs> you know, we could have broadcasted the second half. Um, you know, on SAL Radio on our Facebook page. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to mention that to uh, some of the folks up there. Uh, we were there, mm -hmm. ready to go. Uh, in, in for a situation like that, uh, that's very interesting. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, let's see, Richard, what was your thought watching the game from Florida? My thought watching the game, Florida, total dom total dominating Army performance. Great, great win. They sh they showed what they what they are, what they are, and and what they and what they will be. I mean. They got great support for Andre Carter the third, the offensive linebacker who grabbed his first interception of the year on uh, um, during during the game. A complete team effort. This team is clicking on all cylinders. And even despite you know the the, the weather and you know people left, this was a game where they were expected to roll, and they did and they did roll very big. A fantastic win for Army. Oh, it, 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 it makes it it makes it a very easy and jumping out to a twenty one to nothing lead early really made that really made the rest of the game just just easy to watch. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now Patrick uh, Patrick Morrison, uh, uh, what what was your impression? What have been some of your impressions of the season? I mean, your son Malcolm's having a phenomenal year. Um, got I think forty tackles on the season. 77 before this year. So, um, you know, he's going to have nearly 150 tackles in his career at West Point. What was your thought on uh, his season so far this year and uh, and watching the game on Saturday? Yeah, so I, I believe it or not, I have not mixed emotions. I wanted Army to win, of course. Uh, but I've, I coached probably uh, about five five student athletes on, on, on Bucknell. Really, from out of uh, from out of Stanford, and from when we uh, used to be in Philadelphia, one of Malcolm's best friends, uh, we grew up since they were like seven, um, is on Bucknell. Um, he was a he's a lineman, but um, he uh, he had Achilles injury last week, so he didn't get to play. Um, one of my kids, uh, he's a wide receiver, Ren. He's from Stanford, uh, a high school teammate of mine. His son. Um, was number 45, I think it was Caleb, Caleb Gallon. He made a tackle on a special team. So, so you know, so it's good to see these young people play where you had a hand and, and given an opportunity. 
um, to play college football. So I was very happy for, for to see my boys out there play. Um, but at the same time, um, I had marked this game up as a win for Army towards, towards you know, the bowl game. Because, you know, Army is, is a top-tier institution, top-tier program. And, um, and it really, they, they took this game as an opportunity to fine tune some things. I think like Steve said, we're, you know, we're going into the, into the bowl season with Liberty. Um, Liberty's playing good. You know, they had a Heisman Trophy uh, candidate beginning of the year at quarterback. So, and he's still there. So, um, um, so it's going to be interesting. Um, um, small world, one of my, best friends from back in the day. He played at Mount Vernon High School. His son is the defensive end for Liberty. So, <laughs> so it's a small world, it's a small world. So we're gonna be on down there in Lynchburg, um, Virginia, watching that game, just cheering on all, all, all the young men, and wishing them the best, but, but of course, go Army. Um, hey, yeah, Patrick, just mentioned the program that you uh, taught and uh, mentored and coached uh, some of uh, these future college football players. So, so when I was when we were in Philadelphia, a coach that um St. Joe's uh, St. Joe's Prep, um, on the Gabe Infante, who went to Temple, um, he's he's been there two years now, um, but I coached a lot of them through the Pop Warner program, um, Edmonton Friends Pop Warner, a lot of DeAndre Swift, who I think you guys know from the from the uh, from the Lions. Running back, I mean, he came through my program. I was the athletic director at a um, Enon Enon Tabernacle Church that had its own football program, its own its own field. The field was amazing, um, and and he came out of that. Um, 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 my, um, Pitts, that place for Atlanta. Him and Malcolm have been friends since they've been two years old, mm -hmm. um, um, and he played with me on the Abington Raiders on the Abington Raider team. So you know, there's a, quite a few guys we still have out there at the University of Maryland and different places. Um, so it's always good as a coach uh, to see to see young people do well, at least just get opportunity to go to college and get a good complete education and play the game that they want to play. You know, as we know, it's one in a million to make it to the next level. Um, but it makes my Saturdays go go by pretty good being able to watch uh, these young people play that you had a hand in in getting them there. Um, Absolutely. Hey, Patrick, so just, uh, you know, I, when I talk to Malcolm, I always ask him about his position because he came from being a defensive back and he became an outside linebacker and it's sort of a hybrid position for him. And, it, you know, he's got the athletic ability and the, and, uh, and the toughness to play linebacker. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about how he handles that role. Well, he handles it. Right, he handles it. He does what he does. What is what's asked of him. Um, he loves football, so however and whatever he needs to do to be on the field, he will do it. Um, one thing about the the Apache position, outside linebacker, D back, is that he you know lines him up on the slot. Um, so if he has to cover a slot receiver, so he goes to that defensive back mode. But at times, as you can see, they blitz him. So he's like like that other outside linebacker that that blitzes and has like that short run game responsibility. Um, you know, I, I have feelings about it. You know, he, he's a D back, five five eleven, uh, like one ninety five maxed, um, and playing outside linebacker. Mm, those numbers just don't add up. Well, it's a um, challenge, but he's held up pretty well doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has a he has a messed up shoulder right now. No, you know he, but he doesn't say anything. He continues to play. Um, he loves the game, and, uh, and like and like you guys said earlier, you know, playing a game like Bucknell and then UMass, they're gonna have an opportunity to heal up a little bit and get some get some treatment and uh, get ready yeah. for. Good. Well, I, I'll tell you. I'll tell you, Patrick. Uh, I think number twenty three from Bucknell uh, didn't think he was five eleven. <laughs> when, when, when he caused that fumble, I, that I still a, don't think he knows who hit him. That was a pretty nice <laughs> hit. That was a pretty nice hit. Yeah, yeah that was uh, quite a play. Yeah, he made a few of them. He made a few, came up on a few on the outside and uh, on the swing pass, knocked the guy down. I was like, wow, okay, he's playing. You know, but but you guys mentioned it before, right? You know, this is one of those opportunities where you get your stats up and you know you fine tune some things and 
um, and, and you, you know, you play a game and make you feel good about your accomplishments that game. Um, you don't always get games like that, but it builds that confidence when we go into Liberty and, you know, go, you know what, I'm going to bring it like that again when I go against Liberty or when I go against Navy. I still have it in me and uh, just go for it. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, let Jack McGurk do a little rundown. We always uh, do a talk about uh, keep an eye on what the Naval Academy and the Air Force Academy are are doing. Jack, uh, tell us about uh, about uh, their games. Well, uh, Navy had a bye this weekend. They're heading out to Eastern Carolina uh, this weekend coming up. Uh, but Air Force improved to seven and three uh, overall, four and two in the conference, Mountain West. With a 35-21 win over Colorado State, uh, Falcons had 509 yards total offense, 388 rushing, 121 passing. Brad Roberts led the Falcons with 151 yards rushing on 32 carries. Uh, DeAndre Hughes had 108 yards rushing on eight carries. Uh, sophomore running back John Lee Eldridge III mm -hmm. got the first score of the game with a 16-yard touchdown run with 11-16 left in the first quarter. Uh, Falcons took a 14-0 lead on a six-yard uh, touchdown run by Brad Roberts with 6-13 left in the quarter. Colorado State got on the board with a 15-yard touchdown run by uh, Todd Cintio with 59 seconds left uh, in the quarter. Air Force got the ball back, and Hazik Daniels threw a 92-yard touchdown pass to Brandon Lewis with 10 seconds left uh, in the quarter. Um, the score was 21-14 at halftime. Um after David Bailey came up with a one-yard touchdown run for CSU with 10.09 left in the half. Uh, Ezekiel Daniels threw another touchdown pass, 20-yarder to Dane Kinneman with 7.51 left in the third quarter. Uh, David Bailey came up with another touchdown run, 14-yarder with 5.54 left in the quarter, uh, bringing the score to 28-21 Air Force. Uh, Brad Roberts had a four-yard touchdown run with seven seconds left in the third quarter. Um, both teams were scoreless in the fourth quarter, but it was a 35-21 win for Air Force. Um, Great game for their, for their running game. Uh, they, you know, they're rushing against uh, San Diego State Army, kind of struggled a little bit, but they uh, really seem to bounce back uh, in this game against CSU. And, yeah, well, um, I mean, uh, Air Force uh, looking forward to a bowl game. and uh, But they didn't run that way against Army. Um, and uh, let's uh, – I just wanted to go back. I thought it was, it was unfortunate, like, uh, for everybody um, – you know, with the rainstorm, that was the first time. We've had some games in the rain at Mikey Stadium, but uh, not a thunderstorm that came through. And now the protocol is if that there's a prediction of thunder, they want everybody off the field and they want to get everybody out of the stands as well. I was a little surprised they wouldn't let people uh, stay in uh, underneath the stands uh, they they offered to, they opened the doors to the basketball arena, the Hollander Center, and also the uh, indoor practice facility, the Foley Center. But most people started to go off to their cars, and then all of a sudden the torrential rain came, and uh, so it was uh, certainly difficult uh, uh, on that. What was uh, Steve and uh, and Sam? You were out there. What was your impression of of, of that uh, of what happened? Well. I will tell you that uh, I rushed up to, to save uh, uh, to save the tailgate from blowing away off the top of the mountaintop, uh, and, and I was up there. And then the skies opened up, and then we had hail. And we have hail. Oh my God, we had hail. And then I said, "Listen, if I see one frog come from the sky, I'm done. Just 2020, 2021. <laughs> if I get a frog, I'm done with it." Um, but that wasn't the most painful thing I had to do. I had to actually watch the Air Force game with Sam Houston. That was painful. <laughs> I can tell you something right now. Every play, I don't have to worry about worrying about the Air Force right now. You can do all you want to. It doesn't matter because we beat your ass last week. That's all I heard <laughs> for three hours straight. That was painful. Yeah, I, I, I sort of can imagine that. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> 60 minutes of a commentary on uh, – on the Air Force Academy from Sam Houston. Right. Hey, you know, gu guilty as charged. Uh, yeah. So I'll tell you what, the, the, the thing about Saturday was that it was the best of times. It was the worst of times when you talk about the weather. Uh, it started out bright and beautiful and fall-like. Uh, I helped Steve um, load up his Humvee, and we headed on up to uh, a lot and uh, helped out with getting that uh, really incredible tailgate set up. And, and I gotta say, uh, 
if you're ever at a lot before a home game, uh, just, just go find the Humvee and Steve and his, his massive tailgate. Cause it's, it, it's worth your while, especially if you grab one of those breakfast burritos that they make. Um, and thankfully I did. Mm. And, uh, so the weather just, it stayed beautiful. I mean, we watched the skydivers. Um, we kept making comment that, you know, they're predicting rain, but I just don't see it. Um, we had a, a whole parade of, of, uh, uh, important visitors to our, to the tailgate. Um, I, I even got to talk with Mike Buddy for a little bit, um, which was a first. I, I had never actually met him in person, and, and he was very gracious to stand and, and talk with me for a few minutes. And uh, then we went in the game, and, and you know, for the first quarter, it, it seemed like everything was maybe just going to blow around the stadium. Yeah, beautiful. And it wasn't going to happen, but <clears throat> here it came. I mean, it, and it when it came, man, it 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 came with a vengeance, and 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 to Steve's point, it was biblical. Um, when the hail started flying, uh, I was just thankful that I was up in the loge. And, and I know Steve texted me, and I was very disappointed at his text. He said, I'm, "We're we're taking down the tailgate," and I my response to him was, "Well, what about the sandwiches? <laughs> because uh, they were supposed to make these sandwiches uh, after the game, and I was looking forward to them. Um, the the catering company that he had there, and and uh, I, and he said, no, we're done. And, and I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to eat here in the loge. Uh, but, uh, you know, once once the game was over, though, you know, it really was cleared out. There were a few hearty souls still out in a lot. And uh, we, we stood around a fire pit for a little bit, uh, uh, yapping with some folks. Uh, but it was still misty. The temperature had dropped pretty dramatically. Yeah. Um, and and it, it just was the antithesis of what the weather had been that morning. Um, and, and I'm glad that Steve mentioned the fact about the parents, because I know last week we talked about how, you know, all the folks on the depth had to have been like, hey, mom and dad, this is the game, you know, come on up. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to get some reps in. And then by the second half, you know, everyone had been evacuated from the stadium. Yeah, so most that, of the uh, you bring up such a good point because the parents haven't had a lot of chances, uh, certainly none last year, except a couple of road games to see. Uh, there, I see the team play, and uh, and uh, that was uh, that was very unfortunate. Um, you know, I have to say the West Point band did a great job with their halftime. Uh, they did the military tribute. They got the large flag out on the field, and then as soon as they un they they folded up the flag and ended the show is when the rain came. I mean, <laughs> within about a minute, they were very fortunate to get the flag off the field uh, largely before it started pouring, and the wind came. And then, and then afterwards, I figured that they would just play the alma mater off a recording. But then I, I you know, I go out. To, we did a video of it, and uh, and eight musicians from the West Point band went out, and one of their conductors, and they did the alma mater, and you could hear it. Well, I, had the, I guess I got the microphone reset up. You could hear it from the upper deck. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought that was a very uh, um, memorable moment to see those eight musicians out there maintaining the tradition. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, you know, they, they, uh, you know, they were like the, uh, the ensemble on the Titanic there. They just, the band played on and the band played on in the second half for the army team. And, and, uh, you know, for the, you know, the cadets involved, uh, all you, old grads out there, we were talking about this before we started. I said the band, all the cadets on the band deserve PMI for the rest of the year um, for have, being brave and hardy and being out there and, and keeping the spirit alive uh, by by uh, sharing our, our favorite tunes and, and being there to play the alma mater. But uh, to Steve's point, yeah, I, I, I'm guilty as charged. When we got back to, to Steve's house there in Highland Falls, uh, you know, the Air Force game was on and, and we were watching it and, and everything Air Force did good. I said, yeah, get it out of your system now. You couldn't get it done last week. And I don't care what you guys do the rest of the year because you lost to Army and that's all that matters. So you guys can just blitz the rest of your schedule and we don't care. So, uh, <laughs> and it was the whole game. He's right. It was the whole game. I got to admit, you know, and with the game day experience, you, you definitely, if you're an old grad, by, by, when you go to a football game, you, you've probably had a few adult beverages, you know, uh, celebrating before, during, and after the game. And 
there might have been a few involved that you know make you a little more talkative than you normally are and I definitely had some some pin up talking to do by the time we got back to his house. So. <laughs> yeah. Patrick, uh, Sam is being rather measured tonight. He's uh, not always this <laughs> uh, modest in his comments about about uh, the Air Force Academy. I'm reading um, between the lines. Uh, mm -hmm. I hear. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's go to it's Richard's turn now to uh, tell us about how the top 25 in college football turned out last week. Okay, the top, the top 25 in college football. Number six, Michigan goes to 9-1, and one, defeating Penn State 21-17. to 17. Michigan's 9-1. and one. Penn State is 6-4 and four on the season. As far as Mississippi State and number 17, Auburn, Mississippi State gets by Auburn. They scored 20 points in the fourth quarter. Mississippi State gets the victory 43-34. to 34. Auburn is number 17. Both teams are 6-4 and four on the season. The number two team ranked in the country, the nine Alabama Crimson Tide on nine and one defeating New Mexico State fifty nine to three. Is that going to move them up to? Is that going to move them up further in, in the in the rankings for the college football playoffs? Against playoff? New Mexico State. Yes, New Mexico State. New Mexico State's one and nine on the season. Right now, also number eighteen Wisconsin a thirty five to seven victory over Northwestern. Northwestern's three and seven on the season, while number eighteen Wisconsin is seven and three. Number thirteen Baylor eight and two with a twenty-seven to fourteen victory over number eight Oklahoma. Oklahoma is now nine and one on the season. Number twenty-four Utah seven and three now on the season, thirty-eight to twenty-nine. Arizona picks up, unfortunately, falls to their ninth defeat, one win against nine defeats. Number twenty Iowa an eight and two victory over. Minnesota, which is now six and four on the season. Iowa's eight and two. 27 22, number 20, Iowa for the victory. Number four, Ohio State defeating number 19, Purdue. 51 to 30, 59 to 31. Ohio State's nine and one on the season, while Purdue is six and four on the season. The number one, Georgia Bulldogs, they stay, they'll likely stay at the number one ranking, defeating Tennessee. Georgia is 10, while Tennessee is 5 and 5, a 41 17 victory for the Georgia Bulldogs. 10 and 0 for the number one team in the country, the Georgia Bulldogs. Um, UTSA, a 27 to 17 victory over Southern Miss. Southern Miss is 1, is one and 9 on the season, while U UT, um, the UTSA Roadrunners go to, go to 10 and 0 on the season. Number seven, Michigan State, a 40 to 21 victory. Over Maryland, Maryland's now five and five on the season. The Michigan State Spartans are now nine and one on the season. Only one loss on the season for them. Number fifteen, Ole Miss improves to eight and two, defeating Texas A&M twenty nine to nineteen. Texas A&M is seven three. Well, they're number eleven in the country. While number fifteen, Ole Miss is eight and two on the season. A double overtime game in in LSU. In LSU number twenty five, Arkansas sixteen. 16-13 over LSU, number 25, Arkansas, 7-3, and three, and, and LSU is 4-6 and six on the season in that, after that double overtime game. 4-6 for LSU, scoring, wow. Yeah. A very, a very high scoring game in Wake Forest, but Wake Forest prevails a 9, they're now 45-42 victory for Wake Forest. Wake Forest is now 9-1 on the season, while number 16, <clears throat> NC State, is 7-3 and three on the season. The Notre Dame Fighting Irish, ranked number nine in the country, show up against Virginia, a 28-3 victory for the Irish. Notre Dame's 9-1 on the season, while Virginia finishes 6-4 on the season. Number 10, Oklahoma State, with a 9-1 record now, 63-17 over TCU. TCU goes a 4-6 on the season. Number 22, San Diego State, a 23-21 victory over Nevada. Nevada is 7-3 on the season, while no San Diego State is 9-1 on the season. Number 3, Oregon, 38-24 over Washington State. Oregon State, I mean, number 3, Oregon is a 38-24 victory over Washington State. Oregon is now 9-1 on the season, while Washington State is at 500 at 5-5. Five and five. Cincinnati is now 10-0, a 45-28 victory over South Florida. South Florida is 2-8. On the season, Cincinnati is 10 and 0, 45 28. And a final in overtime, number 21, Pitt, a 30 23 victory over North Carolina in overtime. Pitt is now 
Pittsburgh is now eight and two on the season, while the Tar Heels go to five and five on the season. Yeah, good, good, good run through, Richard. Uh, what do you folks think about how this uh, college football playoff is shaping up? Uh, you know, the uh, Michigan Ohio State game is going to have a lot of meaning, and also what happens in the in the Big Ten championship. Uh, you got Georgia, you got Alabama at nine and one. Uh, you have Cincinnati still undefeated, trying to get it, trying to get in the door, and even teams like Notre Dame um, and Oregon at nine and one. Uh, Sam, what do you think uh, the four might be at the end of this? I'd say watch out this weekend because number one, uh, they just might be falling to that powerhouse Charleston that they play this Saturday. So, uh, you know, that's going to be a big one. Um, We're just playing Charleston. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's see. Um, let's yeah, see. Um, Wait. Georgia, Georgia's playing. Yeah, Ch Charleston, Charleston Southern, 12 o'clock. Yeah, it's going to be tough, let me tell you. So uh, I only throw that zinger out there for anyone who complains about Army playing Bucknell. You know, everyone has teams like this on their schedule. So that's just the nature of the beast. But um, no, it's actually, harder for uh, Army because they're independent. You got it. It's mm. hard to find games. Everybody's playing conference games this time of the season. Yeah, yeah. Just just a reminder to everyone. You know, Army's they only had one FCS team on their schedule this year, so it's it's not time to go up and have a big hissy fit about Army's opponents. You know, they played a lot of teams this year that are probably going to bowl games or are going to bowl games at the end of the season. So their schedule has been pretty legit this year so far. Um, but anyway, is back back to the BCS. Uh, look, it's there is still a whole lot that could shake out of the last few games of the season. Um, and it, it, I personally think that if Cincinnati wins out, and, and just hear my disclaimer here, mm. I'm not saying that I think Cincinnati uh, belongs in the SEC or or you know could could hold their own in the SEC or a conference like that. But Cincinnati is having a season that uh, they control their own destiny. And if they win out, um, if they get excluded from the BCS, it'll be a travesty. And, and especially if they get excluded because someone with one loss gets included in BCS and Cincinnati gets left out. And so as long as you have that... Uh, kind of uh, a subjective factor to the BCS. There's always going to be naysayers about the system and how the teams are selected. Um, I'm concerned that uh, Alabama, for example, you know, and I'm right here in, in Huntsville, Alabama, you know, people live, uh, breathe, and, and, and bleed uh, crimson red blood around here, um, either that or Auburn war eagle blood. And, you know, by all intents and purposes and, and measuring sticks for Alabama football, they're having an off year. They really are. They, they don't look as dominating in every game like they have in the past. And there's a legitimate possibility they could lose to Georgia um, in, if they play Georgia in the uh, SEC championship game. If that happens, Alabama's stuck with two losses, but BCS loves Alabama. So mm -hmm. You know, what happens? Does Alabama get invited to the BCS with two losses if they have a very close loss in the SEC championship game? There would be some one-loss teams that would be very angry about that. So, uh, you know, it remains to be seen. I do believe there's still going to be a couple of teams that drop. There's going to be some dominoes that fall, and uh, it should clear the picture up. Um, but the only uh, PSA that I wanted to make is that if Cincinnati does – maintain control of their own destiny and went out. They need to be in the BCS, period. Okay, okay. Um, we have Steve. What do you think, Steve? Um, I, I, I usually am right on with Sam, but I got to disagree. There are, there, are top, there are five SEC schools would take Cincinnati to the woodshed. <laughs> five. Right now, it wouldn't even be close. Cincinnati has not pulled away from the pack. They, they keep teams like Navy and they keep teams uh, within a touchdown. They, I, if they win out, great. They can they can be like Colorado did in the '80s and claim their national championship, even though it was just a, a you know it was a paper championship. So uh, you got to have the 
four best teams in the nation into that. Cincinnati, not there, not there. Even if they win out, I, I, I know it's undefeated, but you know, I, I, it, it's it's just not it's just not there. But okay. a couple things that I a couple things that I'm excited about. I'm excited that Kansas won a ball game. <laughs> and what does that mean for Texas going to the SEC, right? I mean, good Lord, what the heck has happened with Texas? That's uh -oh. uh, really exciting there. And, you know, Alabama, I mean, Georgia is the, cl the class of the, uh, of the top, top four right now, without a doubt. Alabama is their, you know, their strong reputation alone, um, but they're, they're not as strong as they've been, uh, you know, I'll see how it plays out. I'm interested to see if Michigan, if they lose to Ohio State, is this the last year for Harbaugh? You He's know, nine and zero right now, aren't they? No, they, they lost to Michigan State. They lost to Michigan State. They lost to Michigan State. Okay, so they're they got they got the it, with two losses. You're gonna you're gonna get rid of uh get rid of the guy. Well, yeah. what, what what two losses agree. though? I mean, Michigan State and Ohio State, which is the bane of their existence. So, I mean, yeah. you hired this guy, paid him a ton of money, you let him take the team over to Europe to train, and you know, nothing good happens in Europe, right, Patrick? I'm telling you, you came here, right? So, and <laughs> still, they can't seem to win the big ball game. <laughs> okay, we gotta. Okay, let's let Patrick. Uh, Patrick, what's been your observation on college football and the Schools that are contending for to get into the college football playoff. Well, I I tell you this, I, I like what Cincinnati's doing. Um, I think we I think Army played them a couple of years ago, and and Malcolm came back and said, you know, we probably could have beat them, uh, but they just got some they got some talent over there. They got some talent, Dad, but we probably could have beat them. They had some big plays, so that says a lot. Um, and I'm looking at their schedule, you know. Austin P, Murray State, Indiana. You know what I mean? Like you're not really, really going out there, really challenging yourself. Uh, you know, to say I'm, I need to be in the SEC. You know, when you're playing teams like that, they, Indiana. You know, Temple. I don't, can't remember the last time Temple won a game. Um, you well, see, Temple used to be really good. They could, they'd come in and, and run over Army back in, uh, in the pre jeff Munkin era. Right, right. So, you know, so they're a good program. I think they're going to come up. I just don't think that they would have to change their schedule um, and tighten it up a little bit to be considered for, like, like Steve was saying, the top four and be able to, to, to play and, and compete, at, compete with the Georgias and the Alabamas, you know, and the Auburns. And, and, and when we see that game, like, wow, yeah, you know, I don't think they're there yet. Okay. Uh, that's, my, that's my take on that. Hey, very good. Now, we were having a little discussion earlier today about um, these uh, Sammies and, and what did you, and what is it, an RMI? Some of these um, uh, requirements at West Point, inspections <laughs> and the like that occasionally players get up. Uh, Get uh, or or some of the cadets get relief from. Uh, what was Sam? Tell us again about what you were saying about those. Yeah, well, um, most Saturdays uh, the uh, the core cadets has to have their room in a standard called Sammy, which is Saturday morning inspection. And uh, for Sammy, they have to have their rooms uh, absolutely spotless. Um, they have to have everything folded and put away and hung. Uh, with precision according to the uh, barracks regulation that they use as the template to organize and prepare their rooms for inspection. Um, the beds have to be, you know, made, uh, every, everything is clean and spick and span and ready for inspection. Um, and, uh, but to the cadets, what matters most about Sammy is that you cannot be in bed asleep um, so that means that if you thought you were going to catch a few winks on Saturday morning, you can't until Sammy is over. And then, you know, you can close all your cabinets, close your drawers and, and climb onto the, to the, uh, bed and, and, you know, catch some shut eye. Well, um, there's another, uh, 
type of inspection called PMI, which is post-morning inspection. So post-morning inspection means that everything is still by the standard is supposed to be put away exactly the way it's supposed to be. Everything is hung where it's supposed to be, just like in SAMI. But the big difference is, is that all the drawers are closed, all the, uh, the closets are closed. Um, and on top of that, uh, if the inspecting officer comes in your room, you can be in your bed asleep and uh, the inspecting officer can, can inspect the room quietly uh, or move on to another room, but uh, you're allowed to sleep. So having a PMI privilege is, is huge. And uh, a lot of times core squad athletes get it uh, on game day or if they had a game the night before, um, like in sprint football, we would have PMI, um, you know, the, the morning after games and stuff like that. But, uh, and then as Steve said, you know, the football team would have PMI on game day. Uh, but then again, uh, PMI is also used as a reward. Um, so if cadets do something good, uh, which, you know, cadets, you know, they, they actually do some good things. So if they do something good and it, it merits a reward, then you grant them PMI on a SAMI inspection so they can climb in their, in their bunk and go to sleep. And so my point to, about the, uh, the band members is that for coming back in the middle of the uh, second half and continuing to pick up their instruments and, and feel the spirits of the remaining crowd of the game and, and being there for the alma mater is, hey, when the rest of the Corps of Cadets stayed back after being, just after being sent back to the barracks and nobody came back, hey, those cadets who came back as part of the band those guys need to be put on PMI for, uh, for the remainder of the year. They, they earned it, remainder of this academic uh, uh, semester. Let them have it. They earned it. They, they, they put forth the uh, best effort and uh, let them sleep on, on Saturday mornings while everyone else is out, you know, having their SAMI inspection or whatever, and, and then they can show up in time for the game. What is it for the football players? Because they normally go to a hotel the night before. Um... So they're not around. So what? So uh, what is? What, how? What is it? Maybe we, you know, what, what is it for the football players or any athletes uh, who have to travel? Well, they would be in PMI, and so prior to uh, leaving on, you know, to the team hotel, uh, climbing on the bus and going to the away game or or, or leaving for travel, um, they would have their room prepared but all of the cabinets, all the drawers, everything would be closed and they would be in a PMI and they would have a card up. At least in the old days, we would have a little card that said PMI and I actually still have one. I kid you not, if I'd known we were talking about this, I would have broke it out of my old cadet uh, uh, locker box and, and held it up for you. And you put it on your door right above, you know, so that the inspecting officer can see that this particular cadet is authorized PMI. And it'll have the reason written on it. You know, so it would be football, you know, away game versus, uh, you know, Navy or whatever. And they would have PMI. So the inspecting officer would know, okay, this kid is on PMI. But all the football players, they would, uh, or other core squad athletes, you know, if, if they're on a trip section, um, they would be granted that privilege because, you know, they can't be there uh, to have their rooms ready for Sammy. And likewise, uh, you know, it entails leaving everything wide open. And they're not going to leave it open all weekend long while they're gone. So, yeah, yeah. Let me ask Patrick: uh, How did Malcolm adjust to all of the uh, rigors of cadet life, such as what Sam was just explaining, uh, room inspections and uniform inspections, and all all of that? I, I often wonder how the cadets, ha uh, players, have time to study film. Because they have all these, in addition to schoolwork, they've got these added uh, military duties and, and expectations that they have to fill. How did how did how does Malcolm handle all that? Yeah, so I, I applaud all those uh, cadets, uh, old grads, and and the current um, cadets of West Point, because I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they do it, right? So it's just amazing um, how much they get done um, in a day. 
uh, in regards to their, their military responsibilities and playing FBS football, which we know is, is like a business in itself, the time, the time um, constraints and the time responsibilities to that. So um, I don't know how they do it, but I applaud them all, um, uh, cadet or, or, or student athlete. In regard to me, um, Malcolm would tell you that um, it's hard, Dad, but just a little bit harder than how we had it at home. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit harder than how we had it at home. I, I would not lie to you. Uh, you know, we, uh, we ran a tight ship here. You know, just basic responsibility as a young man that you need to know some things. Right. So, um, yeah, sometimes you got to reinforce that a couple of times in many different ways. And um, but by the time he and his brother, he has an older brother, Langston, uh, by the time they got to high school, um, I would say we didn't have to say anything to him. They knew exactly how to, you know, keep their rooms clean and, and, and take care of themselves. They were, they were young men. So, um, so when so when he had uh, you know ple you know plebeia and he had to go to uh, um, a camp, he was like, "Dad, it wasn't that hard." Mm -hmm. when, 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 they were, when they were yelling at him, he was like, "Dad, it didn't phase me." He came from my go. house. He came from my house. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I did so many. Hey, let me so just many. ask you now: What does Malcolm's brother uh, Langston do? Well, Langston, his older brother, uh, 22 months older, he uh, um, he was a student athlete as well. He played golf at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. Um, and right now, he's staying with us. He graduated this year. Uh, he's staying with us in Chicago as he prepares to uh, go to law school. So he's working, for a, law, he's mm. working for a law firm right now in Chicago. And uh, God willing, in the fall, he'll be in law school. That's great. Uh, Wesleyan's, uh, you know, a top tier liberal arts college. And it says a lot that he uh, graduated from there. That's uh, terrific. And uh, wishing the best on, on going to law school. Now, as we uh, start to uh, wrap up, uh, Jack McGurk, tell us what is uh, Navy and Air Force looking at this week? Uh, Navy is on the road at uh, Eastern Carolina. And Air Force, they're also... Uh, um, going to be on the road uh, against another Mountain West Conference uh, opponent, and that's going to be at Nevada. Okay. Richard, you got a couple of top games you're going to be watching this weekend? Uh, as, far, as far as the as far as the, the, uh, the games that I'm going to be watching this weekend... Well, what are the top three you're going to be watching? Uh, the, the top three I'm going to be watching <clears throat> this weekend will be Come on, come on, get okay. The top three I'm going to be watching this weekend will be let's see, top top twenty five. I'm going to be watching let's see, a uh, number twelve Wake Forest taking on Clemson. That's a, that's an ACC that's ACC a good one. matchup. Um, also, I'm going to be watching number twenty five Arkansas take on number two Al Alabama to see if Alabama can possibly can possibly maybe move, move up to, to number one. But that will be tough with what George is coming up with. Also, I'm going to be watching. Let's see. I'm going to be watching number ten Oklahoma State take take on Texas Tech to see if Oklahoma State can keep up their their will their will as a, as a as a top ten team. And of course, also number five Cincinnati if they can keep rolling and they and can they convince the uh, the uh, commit the uh, committee. But they're going to have to hope that one of the uh, that one of the top four teams slips up. That's yeah. that's not yeah. going Who to be. Who does Cincinnati easy. play, Richard? SMU, Southern Methodist University. SMU's had a good season, but uh, yeah. Cincinnati should uh, be favored by um, seven or ten points in that game. Okay, now uh, UMass. Got to spend a little time. They're having a struggling season. I think they are one in nine on the year. And uh, they've gone through a coaching change. Uh, uh, their coach of several years, Walt Bell, is out. And they also dropped uh, their defensive coordinator. They promoted 
Alex Miller, uh, an alumnus to be the interim head coach, uh, having a tough year. Uh, they're giving up a lot of yards, 477. Um, and uh, they, they can, they're passing the ball. They got uh, 163 yards uh, a game. Uh, but I have a feeling it's going to be a lot like last week. Uh, let's mm -hmm. go down and get your thoughts, Sam. That's yeah, him. parents. Uh, you know, parents of the depth. Um, hey, now's your uh, another chance, and uh, hopefully the weather will not disappoint uh, like it did. Your opportunity to see uh, your sons have the opportunity to uh, excel on the field of friendly strife. Um, this this weekend is going to be uh, very similar to, to the Bucknell game, and that is uh, just about everybody's going to get to play. The, uh, the score is going to get out of hand pretty quick. And uh, you're going to see the starters get, get rested uh, pretty early. Once the game is in hand, you're going to see the starters get, get a lot of rest while the, uh, the depth comes in and gets those opportunities to gain game time confidence by, by actually uh, playing reps um, in, uh, you know, in a game environment. So, um, the score is probably going to be pretty similar. I don't know if we're making our predictions right now. Yeah, go ahead, um, Sam. What's your prediction on this one? Well, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, part of me wants to say Army's going to break to 60 point again, and, and there's all the potential for it to happen again. Um, I'm going to give UMass just a slight benefit of the doubt, given that they are, in fact, an FBS team and not FCS like Bucknell and say that Army comes close but does not crack the 60-point uh, mark. But uh, the final, they're going to come close. So I'm going to say the final is going to be 59-7 to seven, uh, Army over UMass. Okay. But let me just say a precautionary tale. The one thing that we hope for is that there are no injuries. Uh, this is true for both sides of the ball. We don't want UMass players to get hurt either, but I do want to remind everyone, um, I, I reached deep into the confines of my brain housing group to remember that uh, a couple of years ago, um, it was against UMass that uh, Jabari Laws got his knee blown out on a long run. He got, he got his uh, ACL blown out, and uh, that was the end of the season for him. Yeah. So... Uh, you know, let's remember that even, season, even, in the, even in games like this, the prospect of an injury is very real, and it can happen at a moment's notice on the field of friendly strife. So we really hope that this does not happen. But I do predict 59-7. And I'll, I'll conclude with this. Um, I ran and grabbed this just for everyone's reference. Yes, indeed, mm. I do <laughs> have a PMI card. And this, <laughs> this PMI card is, uh, you know, authority of REGS, USCC, U.S. Corps of Cadets. Uh, it was from uh, November 1985, and it was Corps Squad 150s versus Navy. Look at that. So, yeah, that, that's priceless right there. PMI card. Okay. Okay. There's the evidence. Okay, Steve, what do you see in this game? <clears throat> Number one, that was probably a year that the 150s could beat Navy. <laughs> number two, <laughs> number two uh, next week, Sam is going to show us his retainer, which will be exciting. Um, <laughs> you know, as, we're looking, as we're looking at the game coming up, uh, the defense of UMass is very, very, very young. They're big, but they're young, and, and they haven't – they don't have the experience up against an offense like Army's in the triple option or quasi triple option that we run, they're going to be running around uh, in circles out there. Uh, very, very, very young uh, freshmen, sophomores across the board for the most part. Uh, they've got some decent, like I said, decent size. I think we're going to work at the ball outside. It, it, it's interesting that Vegas has Army as a 36 and a half point favorite, but the over under is like 53 points. So th they're saying that UMass is going to score 20 points. I don't see that happening. I just don't see it happening. Our defense is just too stout, uh, and we're going to just put a lot of pressure on them. So my, my prediction will be 56 
to nine, 56 to nine is my prediction. Army's going to have another good week. Get some players out there. Let's try to get let's let's try to get that ball outside on the triple option, and continue the momentum as we as we move forward. I'd love to see us as the number one ranked rushing offense in the country after this week. Um, Would be after all the yards on uh, yeah. over four hundred yards on uh, this past week. You could have another four hundred yard game uh, this week. Yeah, and and I'm telling you, Air Force might have a little bit of difficulty Friday night against Nevada. It's a pretty talented team. So uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But I'm excited. I'll be there in a lot, ready to go. Okay. We will see you before the game. And uh, Richard, what's your thought on the game? Uh, what are you going to sign game. up for? You know, Army has got to keep has got to keep what they're doing. This is going to be another another blowout victory. 50, not, 59 to 7 Army over, over UMass. Okay, they're, they're so you're going to go with Sam's uh, score. <laughs> That's two weeks in a row. Two weeks in a row. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, Jack, what are you thinking about this game? Uh, I think it, it's going to be another uh, blowout, as we were uh, saying before. I was looking at the spread, and the Minutemen are 37 and a half point underdogs uh, in this one. Uh, it's also going to be um, a very emotional game uh, for the seniors, the last game at Mikey Stadium. And, you know, while you do have a few players from the Army football team who are able to go on to the uh, NFL, like uh, Alejandro Villanueva or John uh, Radigan, most of them, after graduating, go right into, uh, into service. So uh, we shouldn't forget that. But um, I think this is going to be a nice uh, blowout win for Army. I'm going to say 56 to 10, Army. 56 to 10. Okay. Now, for someone who will be uh, 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 part of Senior Day, Patrick Morrison, your son Malcolm, uh, be out there uh, with, I, uh, I understand from Coach Munkin, 27 seniors uh, will be recognized. Uh, 27 seniors, four mentors, and he said seven or eight managers. Uh, so nearly 40. Uh, cadets, uh, seniors will be recognized. Uh, uh, first, let's get a score from you on the game. What, what do you think the score is going to be? You got Patrick? Okay. Four, 49 to 17. Okay, so you're going to be uh, make it a little closer. And, uh, you know, we talked about it a little bit before, but, um, you know, we see it each year, senior day. Uh, we've watched players like Malcolm from the time they were freshmen, plebes, uh, and uh, we watch them grow up. Uh, so uh, what's your thought about that? It's going to be uh, something you look forward to, but you know it's part of the, uh, of the change in uh, Malcolm's life uh, coming up over the next year. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh... Absolutely. It's, you know, this is what he wanted to do. He wanted to play the FBS football. That's all he ever wanted to do, um, you know, to show, like I said before, show his school counsel that he was able to play at this level of competition. So he's proved his counsel wrong. He feels good about that. Like once again, he feels good about attending one of the top institutions in the country. Um, so I think, like, like my book, right, he's living his American dream. And um, couldn't ask for anything else. And we, are, we can't be more proud of him um, and his accomplishments. And my mom always said this, and I'm not trying to be <laughs> morbid about this, but she said, hey, when I died, Pat, it's my mom talking to me, don't cry. I said, mom, but you're my mom. I, you know, I'm going to miss you. She said, yeah, Pat, we live and we die. Inevitably, you're going to die. Don't cry. Enjoy the journey in between, and remember all the memories that we had together. Yeah. So, uh, in this moment, you know, when 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 his last game at West Point, I guess I may be sharing, uh, shedding a chair, a, a tear, but once again, right? You know, the journey was something, brother. Those these four years has been a journey. Um, I've enjoyed it. Um, I know he's enjoyed it. It's been some tough nights for him. You know, he's, he's a cadet, um, but. Um, I've talked to a lot. Talked to a lot of people. I said, you know, it's rough now, but when he's when he's all said and done, he's gonna look at look back and say, you know what? I'm glad I did that. 
Yeah, that's what we hear from so many uh, West Point uh, graduates is how much they learned, how much it shaped their life. Um, you know, not just when they're in the military, but for years and years after and uh, in uh, post-military careers in business and education. We see, we see and hear that all the time. Okay, now I'm going to have to pick, I'm going to have to come up with a score. And uh, it's tough um, um, in this. Uh, I again think uh, uh, this is going to be a mismatch. Uh, it's unfortunate UMass is having a struggling season. And, uh, and uh, so I guess I will uh, go and take um, 60. And I, th I think, again, it will be very close to last week. I think UMass will get a get a touchdown, a field goal perhaps. Uh, so I'll go for uh, 60 to 10 and see what happens. I do want to throw out to the group one question that, you know, now Army last week played uh, five quarterbacks. I don't know if Maurice Bellin uh, took a few snaps as well. He got in the game. But you set up now that everybody could be healthy for the stretch drive against Liberty and Navy. And uh, it's worked pretty well with Christian Anderson leading off. They've been getting Tyree Tyler in the games pretty, qu pretty quick. Um, and then you got Jabari Laws, who's playing well, too. He, he led a nice drive. Um, how do you think uh, Coach Munkin's going to handle, you know, having three or four uh, quarterbacks? And then uh, Jamel Jones, too, is, is available. But he's got three solid starters right now. How do you, how do you see Coach Munkin balancing that? Anyone want to take that one on? I, I don't think I don't think he has to balance it. I mean, I think Army Four is where he's going to go, uh, and, and he's going to ride ride that through. Uh, he may switch it up a little with Tyre, but uh, I think uh, I, I feel Army Four is you know won the right to to take us home. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, this this week. I honestly don't think the game against UMass will be much of a, a uh, telling statement about where he stands on starting quarterback because of the level of competition. You're going to see a lot of quarterbacks, just like you did this past week against Bucknell. So, you know, you had both Tyre and Christian Anderson playing a lot in the first quarter. But I think by the time we roll into Liberty, and especially Navy, uh, I I think you're going to see uh, I think you're going to see Christian Anderson taking the helm and, and being the guy who is the leader on of the offensive unit to take us, take us through the rest of the season. And he's our – Okay, yeah, certainly. Hopefully he can stay healthy. Um, uh, Brent Davis, the offensive coordinator, has done a, done a great job in, uh, in utilizing the players that he has at the quarterback position and using their strengths. Uh, uh, so we will watch that, see what happens this week, and then uh, get back here next week and get set for what's going to be a very challenging game uh, against uh, Liberty down in uh, Virginia. I know Sam's going to be at the game. Uh, Steve, are you going to that one? I, you know what? I, I'm on a streak of games, and I've got a five-year-old and a wife, and if I want to keep them and half of what I own, I'm going to stay home. And watch it on TV. <laughs> yeah, I may do the same. Just cause we'll see. It's a long drive down there. Uh, we'll see. Uh, now we're very pleased. And uh, Richard or Jack, anything? Um, Final thought. Army just just needs to keep rolling the keep rolling the way that they're doing. This is this is the this is the crunch crunch time of this of the season. These games coming up, and then of course you know the army, the army navy game at the end, and then of course the the bowl game. They just they just gotta keep keep it up. Can't can't okay. take can't take it off. Very good. Okay, yeah. Uh, you know, people gotta realize this is a glory period for army football. I mean, there have been there was about fifteen years of uh, uh, where it wasn't like this before this, and uh, so this is a a great time to be an army football fan. And we're certainly enjoying it. And if, and if you have the chance, Saturday, be up at Mikey Stadium, 12 noon start. There are tickets available. Should be a great football day. And, uh, you know, and senior day. Now we got to get to our special guest. We really appreciate taking the time to join us. Uh, Patrick Morrison, former NFL player, uh, 
someone who was able to achieve a lot of success coming uh, coming from England. And uh, it's got a couple of books out. Patrick, first take a second and just remind the audience of your two books. Okay, so the first book is called Before Common Ground, Living the American Dream, Journey of an Immigrant Football Player. And it talks, once again, it talks about um, from birth in England, um, the abuse situation and migrating uh, to the United States and eventually signing my contract uh, for the Giants. I just received today um, my second book, one second. Mm. Came in the mail today. And it's, uh, if you can see that, Upon This Ground I Trod. Okay, let me get a picture of that. Can you see it? Let me show, let me show it again. Oh. Uh, you know, you, you're just getting a little interference on the, uh, yeah. the backdrop. On yeah, that. I got this backdrop thing. But um, it's called uh, Upon This Ground I Trod, The Immigrant Journey Continues. And it basically uh, talks about the, uh, the actual life I lived as a football player. So I'm going to take this mm. out real quick. Here we go. Oh, beautiful. Oh. Mm. So cool. This is the second one. It's not out on the uh, on Amazon yet because um, I'm going through the marketing piece now with the publisher, but they just sent me this copy today. So you got this one here and the other one before Common Ground it covers the same thing. So they're mm -hmm. out there. You can always get, a, you can get before Common Ground, you can pick it up now at Amazon and read that until maybe next month, uh, be able to pick up this one and, and watch the journey. Well, Patrick, so good to uh, have you join us. And, uh, and uh, we just congratulate you and your family on Malcolm's success at West Point, what he's uh, accomplished, uh, getting to senior year, playing a big role on the Army defense uh, and a bright future in the Army. Does he, does he uh, have a, a branch of the Army picked out that he's, he's hoping to be assigned to? Um, uh, just skipped my mind right now, but it's dealing with logistics. Um, yeah. quartermaster, uh, quartermaster, yep, quartermaster. Okay, well, that's a great um, field. Uh, the cadets uh, will receive their branch assignments uh, very soon. I think I need to check on that because we, we love to cover that and see the excitement when they open up their envelope that uh, three and a half years of work have earned them a, 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 an assignment as an officer in uh, one of the branches of the, the great U.S. Army. Okay, any final thoughts from anybody? I got one, one last one, Ken, and this is for you, Patrick, and, and just ring this home for you, your son. Sir. As a former Army football player, as a board member of the Army Football Club, at any time, any place after he graduates, he needs anything from, a former, from an Army football player, just pick up the phone, send an email. The Brotherhood is strong. It is very strong, and it is strong for all current and future uh, graduates, and uh, we're here to help each other out. Great. I appreciate it. Yeah. And that's yeah, been consistent. Was... That's been consistent uh, since we've gotten there. That, that, that brotherhood is a, is, is a real thing. So I appreciate it, Steve. I'll let him know again. Okay. Awesome. You know, I, I wanted just to mention um, – uh, when we we talked to Coach Munkin on Thursday and on Veterans Day, and uh, he talked to two former Army players, uh, Ray Wright and J.D. Mote, who uh, were serving in our, in Afghanistan this year, and how the uh, football office kept in touch with them. J.D. Mote had a cell phone they could reach him on, and that they were serving at the airport, and what they accomplished in, in uh, being able to help over 100,000 people get out of the country in that uh, very, very difficult situation. But uh, uh, it was really great to hear about what those two former Army players uh, had accomplished. Okay, well, we're going to uh, finish up. I always finish by saying thank you to the 2 million veterans of the American Legion that we represent and the Sons of the American Legion and our 330,000 members are across the country serving America's veterans. And uh, and we hope everyone had a Veterans Day. I know a lot of uh, the Legion members and the Suns members were down in New York City for the big Veterans Day 
uh, parade last week, and uh, they were all excited about how enthusiastic the crowds were, uh, recognizing and applauding the veterans who participated in that event. Great to great to see and hear. Okay, so we'll be at Mikey Stadium on Saturday. We'll have some interviews on the page uh, during the week, and uh, and uh, we'll have some pregame um, uh, interviews and. Uh, Probably visit uh, Steve Shalou's uh, tailgate beforehand, mm. and uh, should be a great day uh, for Senior Day. Uh, always special uh, for the Army football team. So again, uh, thank everybody: Steve Shalou uh, from the class of '92, Sam Houston from the class of '87, uh, our, my colleagues Jack McGurk and Richard Miller from Sons of the American Legion Radio. And our special guests, we're so glad that he took time to join us today, Patrick Morrison, uh, Malcolm Morrison's dad. And uh, we're glad to see you. We'll see you at the stadium, at Mikey Stadium on Saturday. So for Sons of the American Legion Radio, this is Ken Kratzer. Have a good evening.